and I sure enough indulged myself. <laughs> VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Dan Friedel, Mario Ritter Jr., and Katie Weaver. Alice Bryant answers a question from a learner in this week's Ask a Teacher. We close with an American story. This week, it is To Build a Fire by Jack London. But first, here are Mario and Katie. It is a year of diversity and firsts for Oscar nominations. The Oscars, given by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, are widely considered the top awards for Hollywood and the movie industry worldwide. This week, the Academy honored two women with nominations for the Best Director Oscar, a big change from years past. Chloe Zhao was nominated for Nomadland, and Emerald Fennel for Promising Young Woman. They were among 70 women who received a record 76 nominations. The nominees for acting awards also received special attention. Eleven of the acting nominees have never been nominated before. The decision by film studios to postpone big, costly movies in 2020 permitted new faces to be noted. Six of those nominated for acting awards are black, including the late Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and Andra Day for The United States vs. Billie Holiday. Other black nominees include Viola Davis for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield for Judas and the Black Messiah, and Leslie Odom Jr. for One Night in Miami. Stephen Yun became the first Asian American to be nominated for Best Actor for his performance in Minari. Yoon Ya Jong, a South Korean actress, received a nomination for her supporting part in Minari. And Riz Ahmed became the first person of Pakistani descent to be nominated for an acting award as Best Actor in Sound of Metal. Glenn Close was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for her part in Hillbilly Elegy. It is the eighth nomination of her career, but she has never won. Mank received the most nominations of any movie this year, with ten, including Best Actor for Gary Oldman and Best Picture. The film tells the story of Hollywood writer Herman Mankiewicz, who wrote the script for Orson Welles' 1941 film classic, Citizen Kane. The seven other Best Picture nominees include The Father, Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, Nomad Land. Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, and The Trial of the Chicago Seven. The year 2020 was especially difficult for the movie industry. 
The new coronavirus health crisis meant movie theaters were closed much of the year in America and in many other countries. As a result, moviegoers watched more movies on Internet streaming services. Two of the Best Picture nominees, Mank and Chicago 7, were seen on the streaming service Netflix. Netflix movies received 35 total nominations, while Amazon Films received 12. This year's ceremony for the Oscars will take place on April 25th in at least two places in Los Angeles. One will be Los Angeles train station Union Station, which has been seen in several films. The other is the Dolby Theater, formerly known as Kodak Theater. Other places may also be included. While unusual, it is not the first time the event has been split. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. And I'm Katie Weaver. The large college basketball tournament in the U.S., known as March Madness, begins this week. The men's tournament is being held in the state of Indiana, and the women's tournament is in Texas. Both tournaments are letting fans attend games, and all games are being held indoors. During the coronavirus pandemic, very few people have been permitted at indoor sporting events in the United States, but that is changing as more people are being vaccinated against the virus and COVID-19 is spreading a bit more slowly. Most of the indoor arenas that will let fans watch games in person are very large. They can hold about 20,000 people. However, during the pandemic, attendance will be limited to about 25%. Fans will have to wear face coverings. Fans who do not know each other will not be permitted to sit together. And the arenas will work to make sure fresh air comes in with strong air movement systems. But are these events safe to attend? Alan Hershkowitz is an environmental scientist. He said he would go to an indoor sporting event as long as other people in attendance follow the rules. Given the protocols, I would feel okay about it, he said. The arenas are very high from floor to ceiling. Experts say this helps with safety. Richard Corsi is the head of Portland State University's College of Engineering and Computer Science. He said, I think the risks are probably very low if people follow the rules, stay apart from each other, and keep their faces covered unless they are eating or drinking. Ryan Gensler is the director of sports for a firm that designs large arenas. He said most buildings built in the last 20 years that hold sporting events already have good systems for moving and cleaning the air. They were built that way in order to improve the experience for people watching the games not because of any pandemic worries. Anna Rule is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. She said large indoor arenas like Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis have a lot of air. 
Lucas Oil Stadium will hold the last three games of the men's college basketball tournament. It can seat about 75,000 people. But during March Madness, only 17,500 fans will be able to attend each game. She explained that particles that go into the air, when people breathe, will have room to spread out. So that helps, she said. I'm Dan Friedel. This week, we answer a question from a reader about the many words used for different kinds of roads. Here's the question. What are the differences between avenues, roads, streets, lanes, drives, ways, trails, boulevards, and highways? Well, that is a good question and one that even some native speakers wonder about. Let's talk first about roads. A road is a long piece of hard ground built between two places so people can walk, drive, or ride easily from one place to the other. Roads can be paved or even made of dirt or stone. Roads exist in cities, towns, and rural areas. They can be large or small. The word road is the most general of today's terms and is sometimes used in place of street or highway or other related words. A street is a public road in a city or town that has buildings on one or both sides of it. Sometimes we use the word street for many kinds of roads. Streets often run across avenues, which are wider streets. Let's take the borough of Manhattan in New York City. It has more than 200 numbered streets that run east to west. 42nd Street is one example. Manhattan also has 12 numbered avenues that run north to south. An example is 5th Avenue. An avenue is a very wide street, usually inside a city. In Manhattan, most avenues are around 30 meters wide, while the streets are narrower. Now let's talk about smaller streets, lanes, and ways. A way is a small side street that is connected to a larger street, and a lane is a very narrow street or path. Ways and lanes are often found in residential areas. A boulevard is a wide and usually important city street that often has trees, grass, or flowers planted down its center or along its sides. Drive is used in the name of some public roads. Drives may be big or small. In Manhattan, for example, There is FDR Drive, a six-lane highway. Highways are paved main roads that have several lanes for traffic and connect cities, towns, and other areas. 
vehicles on highways drive at higher speeds than they do on other kinds of roads. And finally, we have trails. A trail is usually a rough path through a field or forest. Some trails are for people and animals to walk or ride on. Others are for outdoor activities like hiking and bicycling. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Alice Bryant. Our story today is called To Build a Fire. It was written by Jack London. Here is Harry Monroe with the story. The man walked down the trail on a cold gray day. Pure white snow and ice covered the earth for as far as he could see. This was his first winter in Alaska. He was wearing heavy clothes and fur boots, but he still felt cold and uncomfortable. The man was on his way to a camp near Henderson Creek. His friends were already there. He expected to reach Henderson Creek by six o'clock that evening. It would be dark by then. His friends would have a fire and hot food ready for him. A dog walked behind the man. It was a big gray animal, half dog and half wolf. The dog did not like the extreme cold. It knew the weather was too cold to travel. The man continued to walk down the trail. He came to a frozen stream called Indian Creek. He began to walk on the snow-covered ice. It was a trail that would lead him straight to Henderson Creek and his friends. As he walked, he looked carefully at the ice in front of him. Once he stopped suddenly and then walked around a part of the frozen stream. He saw that an underground spring flowed under the ice at that spot. It made the ice thin. If he stepped there, he might break through the ice into a pool of water. To get his boots wet in such cold weather might kill him. His feet would turn to ice quickly. He could freeze to death. At about twelve o'clock, the man decided to stop to eat his lunch. He took off the glove on his right hand. He opened his jacket and shirt and pulled out his bread and meat. This took less than twenty seconds, yet his fingers began to freeze. He hit his hand against his leg several times until he felt a sharp pain. Then he quickly put his glove on his hand. He made a fire, beginning with small pieces of wood and adding larger ones. He sat on a snow-covered log and ate his lunch. He enjoyed the warm fire for a few minutes. Then he stood up and started walking on the frozen stream again. A half hour later, it happened. At a place where the snow seemed very solid, the ice broke. The man's feet sank into the water. It was not deep, but his legs got wet to the knees. The man was angry. The accident would delay his arrival at the camp. He would have to build a fire now to dry his clothes and boots. 
he walked over to some small trees. They were covered with snow. In their branches were pieces of dry grass and wood left by floodwaters earlier in the year. He put several large pieces of wood on the snow under one of the trees. On top of the wood, he put some grass and dry branches. He pulled off his gloves, took out his matches, and lighted the fire. He fed the young flame with more wood. As the fire grew stronger, he gave it larger pieces of wood. He worked slowly and carefully. At sixty degrees below zero, a man with wet feet must not fail in his first attempt to build a fire. While he was walking, his blood had kept all parts of his body warm. Now that he had stopped, cold was forcing his blood to withdraw deeper into his body. His wet feet had frozen. He could not feel his fingers. His nose was frozen too. The skin all over his body felt cold. Now, however, his fire was beginning to burn more strongly. He was safe. He sat under the tree and thought of the old men in Fairbanks. The old men had told him that no man should travel alone in the Yukon when the temperature is sixty degrees below zero. Yet here he was. He had had an accident. He was alone. And he had saved himself. He had built a fire. Those old men were weak, he thought. A real man could travel alone. If a man stayed calm, he would be all right. The man's boots were covered with ice. The strings on his boots were as hard as steel. He would have to cut them with his knife. He leaned back against the tree to take out his knife. Suddenly, without warning, a heavy mass of snow dropped down. His movement had shaken the young tree only a tiny bit, but it was enough to cause the branches of the tree to drop their heavy load. The man was shocked. He sat and looked at the place where the fire had been. The old man had been right, he thought. If he had another man with him, he would not be in any danger now. The other man could build the fire. Well, it was up to him to build the fire again. This time he must not fail. The man collected more wood. He reached into his pocket for the matches. But his fingers were frozen. He could not hold them. He began to hit his hands with all his force against his legs. After a while, feeling came back to his fingers. The man reached again into his pocket for the matches. But the tremendous cold quickly drove the life out of his fingers. All the matches fell onto the snow. He tried to pick one up, but failed. The man pulled on his glove and again beat his hand against his leg. Then he took the gloves off both hands and picked up all the matches. He gathered them together 
holding them with both hands, he scratched the matches along his leg. They immediately caught fire. He held the blazing matches to a piece of wood. After a while, he became aware that he could smell his hands burning. Then he began to feel the pain. He opened his hands, and the blazing matches fell onto the snow. The flame went out in a puff of gray smoke. The man looked up. The dog was still watching him. The man got an idea. He would kill the dog and bury his hands inside its warm body. When the feeling came back to his fingers, he could build another fire. He called to the dog. The dog heard danger in the man's voice. It backed away. The man called again. This time the dog came closer. The man reached for his knife, but he had forgotten that he could not bend his fingers. He could not kill the dog because he could not hold his knife. The fear of death came over the man. He jumped up and began to run. The running began to make him feel better. Maybe running would make his feet warm. If he ran far enough, he would reach his friends at Henderson Creek. They would take care of him. It felt strange to run and not feel his feet when they hit the ground. He fell several times. He decided to rest a while. As he lay in the snow, he noticed that he was not shaking. He could not feel his nose or fingers or feet. Yet he was feeling quite warm and comfortable. He realized he was going to die. Well, he decided he might as well take it like a man. There were worse ways to die. The man closed his eyes and floated into the most comfortable sleep he had ever known. The dog sat facing him, waiting. Finally, the dog moved closer to the man and caught the smell of death. The animal threw back its head. It let out a long, soft cry to the cold stars in the black sky. And then it turned and ran toward Henderson Creek, where it knew there was food and a fire. Mm.